Good morning, and welcome to an ethical corporation webinar on the SDG integration across the supply chain. I'm Candy Telani Anton, Senior Project Director at Ethical Corporation, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. The SDGs have been a hot topic in sustainability since their inception with businesses, governments, and the NGO community, widely accepting them as a roadmap for the future. Such a hot topic, there has been over 1,600 sign-ups just today. Today, you will hear from experts on how to implement the SDGs into your business operations and create the disruptive change required to change the world's current path. We will cover and identify the meaningful SDGs to your business, map against your operation on a local, national, and regional level, engage the business and suppliers on the need and opportunities to integrate them across the supply chain functions, measure your impact against the SDGs, implement an SDG-driven supply chain strategy across your operations to drive business, climate, and social impact. Today, joining us, we have Anna Swaits, Sustainability Advisor and former Sustainable Development Director at Saab Miller, John Ku, Innovation Partner at Interface, Aris Fretos, Program Director at Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, and Munish Data, Head of Plan A and Facilities Management at Marks & Spencer. Today's one-hour webinar will be in the form of presentations, followed by a focused discussion where the speakers will be sharing best practice and lessons learned of the work they are doing to integrate the SDG across the supply chain. So before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this is an interactive discussion. On the right-hand side, you will see a box where you can post your questions. Please do post your questions throughout the, the discussion, and we will hope to get these answered. So to kick off um, things off, sorry, we'd like to run a, a couple of uh, polls for those listeners. So first one. Is your organization integrating the SDGs into business strategy? Please vote. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, we close it. Thank you. So how we see is 43% uh, is a yes, 24% is a no, and a very interesting big number, 32% is yes, but just starting. Um, so amazing. So the second uh, question to all of you will be, is your organization measuring your impact against the SDGs? Please go ahead. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you very much to all of you. So as we see, 26% is measuring uh, a yes, but a big majority, a 74% is a no. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and the last question is, what are you struggling with the most with SDG integration? And here we have some options. Identifying the relevant SDGs, mapping against your operations, measuring your impact against the SDGs, educating the whole business on the SDGs relevance and opportunities, and uh, finally communicating your impact against the SDGs. Go ahead, please. Five, four, three, two, one. We close the poll. Thank you very much for um, your answers here. Very interesting majority about measuring your impact. Um, it's always difficult to put that number. Uh, second one, 39% e educating the whole business on the SDGs, followed by a 10% mapping against uh, the operations, and uh, uh, finally fourth and fifth in the same position, identifying the relevant SDGs and communicating your impact against the SDGs. So a clear uh, message here for measuring the impact and educating the whole business. Um, thank you very much to all of you. Aris, um, I'd like to ask you, just because I know you have worked on this area for a while now with many businesses, what are your thoughts on those polls? Thanks, Candy. Uh, um, that's very, it, it is very interesting, and it's in a, in a way not very surprising. Measurement 
is is generally considering the audience is is generally one of the biggest challenges not just in terms of the SDGs but also in terms of sustainability more broadly and there's all kinds of, of metrics and evaluation I, I, there's a really positive sign uh, to the first question which is the organization are, are starting to integrate and I think that the way the question was framed is not whether you've integrated but are you integrating the SDGs and I think that's a very honest way of doing it. A, a big chunk of, of, of participants have responded that, that they are and, and so I see that as a really positive sign from our experience, we see a lot of organizations taking different approaches and are then experimenting, trying different things and, and so on. The biggest, one of the biggest challenges is, uh, is in the last question, is educating the business, building the understanding, the knowledge and, and the capacity. Pretty much the same as, as with sustainability, that becomes a catalyst for everything else, including measurement and so on. So that will continue to be a, a big, big priority over the next two, three years until we get to a critical mass of knowledge around the SDGs. Thank you very much, Aris. That's r really insightful. Okay, so let's uh, start things uh, off. Uh, uh, Anna will be presenting her approach as a former Sustainable Development Director at Sabina. Over to you, Anna, please. Thank you very much, Candy. Um, and hi, everyone. It's great to join the panel today. So as, as Candy said, I'm currently working independently as a sustainability advisor, but at the time the SDGs were launched in at the end of 2015, I was sustainable development director for SAB Miller. Um, and we spent a lot of time thinking about and, and working on our approach to, um, I guess, integrating and aligning the SDGs with our, our sustainable development strategy. So what I wanted to do was just, just talk briefly about um, what we did, how we approached that, um, we took quite a systematic approach. And then I guess reflecting back now, having not worked in that, uh, SAB Miller was acquired by AB InBev at um, the end of 2016, and I left the business shortly after that. So I guess I have the benefit of a little bit of hindsight as well to reflect back and think. So what did we learn and what were the big challenges that I certainly left unresolved in that business? And I think are sort of common challenges, judging by those polls as well, that, that face many businesses still today and many of the businesses I've been working with. So when the SDGs were launched, um, SAB Miller's sustainability strategy, Prosper, was about a year old. And we were very much in the mode where we had identified a clear set of priorities and we knew exactly how those how those sustainability priorities aligned with um, business priorities. Um, we understood the relate, you know, the relationship to to sort of cost and risk and future growth opportunities, and we were working hard to integrate and embed those priorities right across the business, sort of through every function. I mean, and to give one example of that, we were working on how did we integrate. Um, approaches to support small-scale retailers into our sales force and, and selling approach across Latin America, Africa, and, and other parts of the business. So we, it, we were very much in that kind of alignment phase. We tracked quite closely um, the development of the SDGs and looked hard at how were we going to ensure that, that Prosper, our sustainable development strategy, also could be aligned with this as you know the key new external framework. Um, and we were, so I guess very early on, mapping and looking at what that, that alignment was. And we identified then two big opportunities to, to, to really use the SDGs and engage with the SDGs. The first was to, I guess, to drive internal awareness of how our sustainability agenda connected to a much bigger global agenda using the SDGs as the, as the, uh, the, the framework to communicate that. And then the second opportunity we saw was I guess to use the SDGs as the basis for a very systematic strategic assessment on an ongoing basis of what our um, sustainability priorities needed to be. So when very soon after the, the goals launched in, in 2015, we ran an inter a big internal campaign to um, communicate the goals and their alignment with PROSPER. We developed some uh, sort of quite striking visual aids to really get people around the business understanding what what 
the priorities were that, that the rest of the, the world was thinking about and how actually we were already through our sustainability strategy um, to a large extent aligned with those. But having run that campaign, we then did a very sort of systematic piece of work, working with Earth Security Group to look at how could we adopt the SDGs as a framework for sort of ongoing strategic review. And what came out of that, you know, as we so we looked at the goals, but both at a goal level and at an indicator level, and it's that indicator level, you know, the 169 um targets that was i guess really quite unfathomable quite difficult for business to to grapple with so we sort of took the time to really work through both at a goal and a target level and, and understand how did these things relate to our business and we came up with sort of four important dimensions to think about the first was you know is there a relationship or a does this particular target or, or goal drive or have an impact on our business operations and our cost base so that was number one the second was is there an impact on our license to operate our, our reputation and our and our license to operate the third was what is there an impact or, or potential for innovation and growth related to this goal and, and to this specific target area and the fourth was is this area is this a a i guess a societal priority that matters for our business as well as for broader society and um, so we worked through using those four dimensions and came up with a very clear picture of actually which goals and which targets really mattered for our business because they either would impact operations our license to operate our sort of growth agenda or simply they just they mattered because of the type of business we were and the um, areas we were operating in and we mapped that at a global level and also for some key, key markets and then used that as part of our um, strategy processes to look at how did we need to, um, I guess, continue to evolve our, our sustainability priorities. And let me just, I mean, talk very briefly about those four areas and that will then lead me on to um, summarizing the, the learnings that we had. So I think, I mean, the first one's pretty obvious, this idea of, well, is there a, an operational impact or a cost impact? And for SAB Miller, the biggest goal in that area was around water and water risk and the potential for disruption to our operations as a result of lack of water. So I think, you know, that's um, a, a key one. License to operate and reputation, again, water um, for the SAB Miller business was... Um, sort of scored highly against that dimension, but also things like health um, due to the link with alcohol consumption and, and a number of other areas. The third one around growth and commercial opportunity, I think this is where, you know, there's been a lot of focus of the last, over the last couple of years and the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, you know, published a big report looking at where the growth opportunities were. I think this started to get people, new people in the business engaged and excited because people started to think, oh, this is an agenda that could be about exciting and about growth and, and you know, disrupting the business and coming up with new growth strategies rather than just looking for risks and, and problems. So that was, you know, really interesting area. And there was, you know, quite fruitful things came out when we actually systematically went through looking against that dimension. And then the fourth area around societal priorities, we didn't have that in there initially in our framework. And we realized as we went through the assessment that actually that's absolutely critical because if you don't actually as a business ask yourself the question not just you know what's the cost impact or the growth potential but actually what kind of business are we and what what do we care about because of our heritage our you know the location of our operations what our employees care about because of the kind of society we think we need in order to operate then you miss actually a whole load of of, of priorities within the sustainable development goal agenda so you know those those four thinking about it through those four lenses was for us really really useful in sort of honing our priorities so just um then to just move on and summarize so what did we learn um four key things again i don't always think in fours but the, uh, as i was thinking it through there were really four key learnings from from taking that approach firstly um that you can't go through and just 
cherry pick the positive exciting stuff to focus on that that um creates growth opportunities i think it's brilliant that there's been so much focus on where the commercial opportunity for business is within the sdg agenda but actually they are an interconnected set of goals and as a business it's important to to think about them like that and to think about the balance of where's the opportunity and actually where's the responsibility because there are you know real or potential negative impacts as a result of your business so i think it's key to to look across all of the goals and and not and not just be cherry picking you know a couple that look really exciting because there's some some commercial opportunity there the second learning was around i mean this is really um, a challenge that every business faces as well the need to partner to really achieve any impact against any of those goals you know there, there was there are such big systems challenges embedded in each SDG whether it's water or, or food and ag or it's um, gender equality and actually we realized that we didn't have um, the necessarily the the number or the 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 depth of partnership that we needed to address some of those those key areas. The third learning was around the need to really be prepared to change current business models on the basis of, of understanding both risks and opportunities. And you know, it's not really enough when you when you do that strategic assessment against the SDGs and and look at where risks and opportunities are it's, it's not enough to just say well you know we're doing x y and z and that contributes to goals three seven and eight i think you know as businesses we need to move a long way beyond that to actually thinking well if on if we can see negative impacts or potential negative impact what do we need to change in order to address those and if there's huge commercial opportunity well how can we you know really disrupt the current business model what can we learn from other sectors in order to, to help us think through how we do that to, to capture that opportunity it's not it, you know this isn't just a communications exercise and then the fourth learning and it came up really strongly in the poll is around measurement i think you know it's been talked about a lot over the last couple of years measurement of impact on the sdgs by business is key i think we're nowhere near really a, a sort of aligned approach to doing that um and you know, I think a, a vision of a future where there is alignment and aligned framework for businesses to report on their progress against the SDGs is exactly the right vision to have. But we need to be really careful not to jump to something that's simply too complicated um, or too, I guess, rigid and it creates a, a reporting culture rather than really a culture of, of looking at um, risk and opportunity and and being quite strategic about using the SDGs as a tool to do that. So I'm a big, you know, very much in favour of a move to more aligned measurement, but in quite a, a considered right way, where I think the starting point is probably businesses themselves figuring out what me what's really meaningful in terms of impacts to report on, and then and then having a dialogue in order to figure out how well, how do these metrics then converge over time, rather than sort of imposing from outside some kind of unifying measurement framework that that actually just a one-size-fits-all measurement framework probably just is never going to be um, successful on first attempt so those were the sort of key learnings reflecting back and i will um i'll stop talking there so that candy you can move on to uh mm. to the next person but very happy to take questions later on yeah thank you very much anna very interesting please john um to you Thanks, Candy, and delighted to share a few perspectives from Interface um, today on this webinar. So just for those that don't know Interface, we're, we are a manufacturer of modular flooring with a strong track record in sustainability over the last quarter of a, a century. And um, for example, we've reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by 96% since the 90s, um, and 88% of all our facilities run on renewable energy. Now for this webinar, we're an example of a large-ish slightly smaller company um, and in all honesty when it comes to the UN sustainable development goal it's still a bit of a work in progress for us and um, it's something that's important to us but it's something we've been working on so for in the face we we see the SDGs as a great opportunity they are a wonderful framework to help shape your goals 
Um, one thing I would argue, though, is some of the phrasing. Um, when you think from a business perspective, you need to, to reword them and reanalyze them and reframe them slightly. Um, for companies with a track record in sustainability, such as the ones that are joining us today, um, there is a little bit of retrofitting because, you know, with the SDGs, you, you've been doing good work before. Um, some of those fall into um, work and challenges, goals, targets, and indicators that the SGDs cover. Um, but they're also a great opportunity to be a catalyst to challenge the work you've done before, to optimize them, to see what gaps you have and where else you can have an impact and to boost those, those goals. Um, I've recently come across the term SDG washing in the last couple of months, um, which is a, akin to greenwashing. Um, and I think the key lesson for us there, and the key lesson for this group, is the SDGs, as Anna said, they're not a checklist. Um, you can't you, you can't do them all and say we do a little bit of one a dash of seventeen. Um, it's it's something where I think you do need to focus and prioritise. Um, and as Anna was saying, you can't go too far the other way either. You can't just cherry pick because you're good at a certain few or they sound like they're important to your brand at that that time. So for us, we're in our mission to focus and prioritise. We focused around, um, I'd, you know, I'd say around four of the SDGs. Um, the first of which is uh, number 12, responsible consumption production. Um, we've been very keen to increase our use of recycled materials. We, 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 our, our base is polymers and plastics. And that obviously a huge issue that we're facing now is the recyclability of, of plastics and their responsible use. And for us, we want to move from a and a take and make waste approach to starting a waste, making it beautiful and ensuring that we can bring it back at the end of life. And that fits very nicely with the SDGs and the, the targets are good for us there too. Also a new SDG 13, climate action, our new mission is climate take back to run our goal, um, to run our business in a way that reverses the effects of, of global warming. Um, and examples of what we're doing there is around all of our products around the world are now carbon neutral. Um, and we're also working in the future to find products that can actually sequester carbon. So we can look at whether it can become carbon negative. And um, one thought on UNSDG 13, from a business perspective, when you run through the targets, the indicators, they're very much government aligned. So again, there was that need to kind of rethink, um, reword and rework them to work for our purposes. And then to focus on another aspect that Anna mentioned, partnership. Um, if we look at SDG 17 um, and the, the fact that partnership is what's going to make this happen, it's not something you can do alone. Um, two examples within that. Firstly, we had a wonderful relationship with our yarn supplier actually over the years, challenging each other to be more sustainable, whether on energy or materials. Um, and we will work with them and frame our discussions more and more around the SDGs. Um, and then we have a new exciting partnership actually with uh, Manufacturing 2030, it's being run by Two Degrees, and they're giving us this opportunity to, to speak and connect with other manufacturers around the SDGs. Um, and I, what I quite like about what they're doing is they're giving a chance for us to engage with our supply chain with the expertise of other peers, um, and also think about how we're talking to our customers around the SDGs. And then finally, I know I'm running out of time a little bit. Um, SDG 14 in the oceans, um, we've done a lot of work around networks project um, in a partnership with the Zoological Society of London to tackle the issue of marine plastic through collecting fishing nets and turning them into wealth and opportunity for communities in the Philippines, um, Indonesia and Cameroon. And again, that would never have existed without partnership. Um, and again, that's kind of grown with Next Wave and Dell and Boreo and General Motors. It's it's when companies come together that I think we're seeing this a chance to have real impact on the issues covered in SDGs. Um, final few reflections. Um, for us, any discussion around UN Sustainable Development Goals includes a discussion around how is this going to grow the business? How is this going to benefit our brands? You cannot get away from that. Um, another thought on the reporting angle, I'm quite excited to see the collaboration between um, GRI and the UN Global Combat um, and a few others. I think they just released a report with PwC 
around integrating the SDGs into corporate reporting. It's a kind of a practical guide, but well worth a look. In terms of concerns to fuel the questions, I am concerned about adoption of the SDGs for mid-sized and smaller com companies. And I know this is an issue that UN Global Combat are looking at, but I think it's much easier for us, for the MNSs of the world, SW Millers, um, to be adopting. But I wonder when you look at smaller and mid-sized companies, you know, what the impetus is there and whether it's flowing through. Um, a little bit similar to that is, I worry that the SDGs are sometimes a bubble within an organization around a leadership level or a sustainability team level or certain departments. And I think one of the key challenges, in that, and I mentioned this too, is how you embed it through an organization. And I'm happy to share in the questions how we're attacking that. Um, and as a final thought, with the SDGs in any role you play in a, in a company, I think and as, as a company, you need to be bold with how you're approaching them. But you also need to be really authentic. Because I, I see a lot of statements, and I, I come back to this phrase of SDG washing again. The sustainability community, investors, and customers will see through um, any kind of cherry picking or any kind of faux um, strategy on the SDGs. Something we, as a community, have to be very aware of. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for that. Please, um, Aris, to you. Thank you, Kari, and, and, and um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I think John and Anna mentioned some really good points that are um, very obvious in all the work that we do um, uh, around the SDGs. The, um, our work, the Cambridge Institute for um, Sustainability and Leadership, we, um, j just to set a little bit of context, we work with a couple of dozen companies around the world specifically on the SDGs and then um, uh, a couple of hundred companies um, every year uh, around um, sustainability, uh, critical global challenges, leadership and, and so on, whether that's research or building leadership capacity, knowledge, awareness, practical application um, uh, and, and, and these types of, of projects. And um, I agree with um, the point about um, you know, the SDG washing. I, I think this is inevitable. We see a lot of, you know, the SDGs are, are a very sort of popular and hot topic, and inevitably you um, see a lot of people communicating um, about it. And that's, you know, that's not a bad thing um, uh, in, in many ways, but one has to be, as John said, cautious uh, and, and try to, to filter uh, some of those initiatives. I think most people, in our experience, struggle a little bit, and again, inevitably so, with, with the how. You know, what what is it that we, we can do, that we should do, and how do we go about it with with regards to the SDGs? And, and the poll was, I feel like, illustrative of that challenge. In the work that, that we do, when we work, of course, with, with kind of supply chains, we bring different parts of the supply chain together, but also with kind of big international um, organizations, we also use a bit of a filter to initially at least to prioritize, to help organizations choose what is it that you know, what parts of the SDG agenda make more sense and, and similar to what Anna was saying in a way we we use kind of three or four criteria the first one is um, do our operations have a, an impact on the on the on the goal and depending on the appetite or the level of sophistication we always we also look at the level of the targets um, as kind of what Jenny was saying and, and if if we have an impact, you know, then what do we do about it? And that's why I think most companies will have SDG 12, sustainable consumption production, or eight, economic growth, um, as as part of their agenda. The second point is, um, can the company have an influence, or can can it contribute to the success of the SDG? And I think that's where most organizations are. Uh, uh, Start. That's where they use the platform. You know, they, they they look at what they are doing at the moment in sustainability and say, how does that map against what the SDGs are saying? Which is you know, which is a helpful starting point. But as Anna was saying, um, you know, it's it's only one step into the the direction. The third question that we ask is the commercial implications question. Do do does achieving the goal? or the specific targets? Is it important to the success of the business, the viability of the business model? 
And I guess this is where sustainability as a whole has moved over the last couple of years. And um, what is it that is critical? What critical resources, conditions, expectations, behaviors, practices do we rely upon as a business five, ten years down the line? And um, I think some organizations, this, this, uh, there's not a lot of organizations that are looking at, at that yet, but I think that the number is, is increasing. We certainly work with more and more taking that um, view. And of course, that's also why, you know, for example, climate change, SDG 13, is a given for every single company, regardless of whether it's directly material or anything like that. Climate change has to be uh, in part of an SDG materiality metrics of every single company because it has that big impact on the success of the business model in five, ten years' time, um, as well as today. And the final question that we ask is, is the goal important to the company's position as a responsible business? I think what this is really uh, similar to what Anna was saying about the responsibility, the, the license to operate, and so on. And depending on you know, how organizations answer those questions, then um, that is uh, that allows for a set of responses and set of activities and actions that are commensurate to, to consumer to, to what um, the, the follow-up needs to be. There's two important points for, from the work that, that we do. Um, and we work um, at CSL in Cambridge. We work with the academia world. And, you know, there are many initiatives like the Cambridge Global Challenge Initiatives and, and other parts of a lot of very, very smart people looking into very specific challenges. And we also work with our a CSL network, which is predominantly businesses from around the world, the investor community, our investment leaders group, our banking and environment initiative, and our climate wise with insurance companies, so the finance sector, and with governments. We work a lot with governments around the world at the European level, at national government level. And the point that the, this, the interconnectedness of the SDGs is, is a very valid point. And um, in a way, every single organization can tackle all 17 of the goals through collaboration. And in some way, all 17 of the goals will have some kind of impact into the organization's success, appetite, uh, impact on stakeholders, the value it creates, and, and, and so on. And we have started a conversation. We, 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 we ran a project last year uh, called the Rewarding the Economy Inquiry, um, which was about the commercial imperative to the, the SDGs. And we're following that up now with a conversation about an SDG 100. Can we bring together a group of, of, of companies to explore the opportunities, but also the risk management, the, the, the share of, of best practices around the SDGs. Can we find a way to enrich the decision making that the organizations do um, in, in this space? And the other is the combination of innovation and capacity building. I think that that's that, that's very important and increasingly, I think as Anna and John were saying, you know, it's, there's lots of great ideas, there's lots of, of, of good innovations, and increasingly we will be seeing more of. It is essential that these are starting to move to the center of the organization and do not stay siloed. And, and that requires um, awareness and understanding and acceptance of the sustainability and the SDG significance, but also the, the necessary capacity for, for uh, parts of the organization to take this forward rather than leaving the experimentation to, if you like, stay where, where it is. And, and the final point that I, um, I want to make, and I'm looking forward to, to the conversation, is that while we already see business leaders in our education programs, for example, no longer ask the question about why when it comes to sustainability, it's more about what and how. People are still struggling with that question because Delivering the SDGs ultimately requires some big changes, and, and most of those changes are not, if you like, very convenient for many organizations, including the need to work more collabor collaboratively with others. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of difficult um, changes that need to happen that we still haven't un unpacked. And through that combination of collaboration, capacity building, and innovation, that's where we see the most forward-looking companies starting to tackle some of those difficult um, conversations. So that's it for, for me for now. Hi, Monish. Thank you, Aris.
Muniz, please, to you. It's unmuted. Right. Sorry, just one second. We have a uh, technical issue with uh, Munish microphone. I think he's unmuted. We're going to try to connect with him. Ah, I think morning. I'm now on. Hi, hi. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Hi. And apologies yeah. for the slight technical glitch. Um, it's a real uh, pleasure and privilege to join um, uh, people from around the world on this um, on this webinar about the SDGs. And actually, quite a difficult task to follow um, the excellent um, presentations we've had from Anna, John, and Aris already. But I'm going to give it my best shot. So I, I work for MNS. Um, we're for those that don't know, we're a uh, we've got 1,500. Um, physical shops around the world in 50 different countries, as well as a very significant online uh, presence. We have 80,000 employees serving 30 million customers through our various sort of channels. And um, we've got a significant supply chain across the globe, much of which is exclusive to Marks & Spencer, which brings responsibility and risk in equal measures. And I'll come on to how SDGs play into that a bit later. Before I go into the MS sort of um, uh, I suppose, case study on, on SDGs. Um, I just want to make some observations about SDGs as a whole. I think they're the first um, really comprehensive framework for sustainable development. And, and actually, they're applicable uh, in their theoretical sense to all sectors of society. So governments, private sector, civil society, and, 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 the, and common customers or public as well. And, and Quite recently, um, there's an already been alluded to from, uh, from um, earlier in this in this webinar. There's been quite a lot of focus on what the economic opportunity is from the SDG. So, if you get an opportunity, you look up a, a report from the Business and Sustainable Development Commission. I think it came out either in the last year or so. A collection of 36 leaders from various different parts of society, who who actually um, uh, calculated the SDGs could unlock economic opportunities worth at least. 12 trillion dollars a year and if you take into account the sort of um, ripple effect of that that could be two or three times larger still when benefits are captured across the whole economy accompanied by labor and resource productivity as well so it, you know there's lots and lots particularly that report of, of um, evidence to say there's a huge economic opportunity from SDG adoption um, Aris has, has already talked quite a lot about the work that CISL um, have done in terms of rewiring the economy, which is truly groundbreaking work because it translates what is quite a complex set of 17 SDGs into six sort of groupings and 10 tasks and really breaks it down quite nicely. So again, another plug really for that piece of work. It's, it's really good to look at uh, both the economic opportunity and then how it actually translates. And for companies like Marks and & Spencer and, and others on this call, um, Actually, there's a twofold economic opportunity or commercial opportunity for SDGs. One is um, the cost of inaction or, or just standing still, not doing anything, not responding to them. So that for us leaves us unresponsive to things like extreme climate events, which, which, which affect our own and our supply chain operations. Of course, they affect our customers and the communities that work in our supply chain right around the world. And on the other hand, it also means that we'll not be fit for purpose as an organization to handle the disruptions that could come from SDG adoption in the marketplace as a whole. Disruptions from, for example, transitioning to a low carbon economy or to a circular economy. If we're not ready for that change, which is undoubtedly going to come, then that will leave Marks and Spencer stranded. Equally, um, there are then, you know, building on that, huge amounts of commercial opportunities from being part of that transition, from being part of the low carbon economy, from being part of a circular fashion economy, for example. And I'll just, you know, the earlier report I mentioned from the uh, Business and Sustainable Development Commission said 12 trillion by 2030. 2030 is not far away. So in terms of now bringing it into M&S and what SDGs specifically mean for M&S, M&S has been in the game of sustainability uh, since, seriously, since 2007 when we launched it, which of course predates the SDGs, which came out in 2015. We um, devised 100 commitments that tackle, for us, the most important environmental and economic and social issues 
for us as a business, for our supply chain, and of course, for the communities we trade in from farms to factories to shops. And important, that's an important factor that, you know, just like the SDGs, our plan isn't just a plan for our own operations. It deals with the big issues right across our value chain, um, right through from one end, our supply base to the other end on how our customers use our products. And, and the SDGs are a very comprehensive framework that, that enable, enable that to happen as well. And, and 10 years of, of working on this has, has sparked some great innovation, m &S. We've done things quite differently. So we, we're, we are still the only carbon neutral major retailer in the world. But at the same time, we've been working hard to reduce our energy consumption by 40%, our carbon emissions by 28%. Since 2012, we've only sourced renewable energy for procured renewable energy for all of our UK and Irish operations. And we've not sent any waste from our UK and Irish operations to landfill since 2012. And in terms of circular economy and examples like that, we're only on a very, very foothills of discovery on this. But we have, uh, with Oxfam, been collecting clothes for our shopping initiative and have collected 30 million garments since we launched it about seven years ago. So there are some examples of how, I suppose, pre-SDGs and even then mapping SDGs, we have been seeing some real benefits to our business. And if you aggregate all of those and, and add up some of the measurable ones only, um, that, that aggregates to about £750 million pounds sterling um, of, of benefit, of net benefit after all investment, off applying Plan A, our sustainability programme, to Marks & Spencer since 2006-07. But, and it's a big but, the customer context is changing. The world is changing very fast. Our customers are telling us that they're really experiencing huge amounts of political, social, technological change. And they're looking for responsible businesses like m and to be at the forefront of this change uh, and to play a leading role and help them transition through this change, which is why the plan as uh, plan A has never stood still. And in 2017, we relaunched it, shaped it around three bold goals, well-being to help 10 million people live happier, healthier lives, communities to help transform a thousand communities around the globe and planet to truly become a zero waste business. And our stakeholders, not, not just our customers, but we go out and talk to a lot of the important NGOs, the uh, government, academia. They told us that companies like m and should develop social and environmental targets that support the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So it was very obvious then with our plan to do a direct mapping into what the SDGs um, mean for our plan. And if you look at our Plan A report from 2018, um, which is widely available on the internet, you'll see that We've, for each of those pillars, well-being, community and planet, we have mapped the SDGs to each of the commitments that sit under those pillars. There's 100 commitments that sit onto it. So, for example, under well-being, unsurprisingly, SDG 3, good health and well-being sits there, but also SDG 17, partnerships for the goals, which recognises that we can't do everything on our own. Under community, you know, there are a number of things like SDG 4, quality education or gender equality, SDG 5, and many others that map directly to our commitments under community. Under planet, unsurprisingly, climate change, SDG 13, um, affordable and clean energy, SDG 7, all are just two examples of falling into that. And we've also got a very deep commitment to, um, to making sure that, you know, we deal with the salient human rights issues that connect to our activities. Uh, under the Modern Slavery Act and others. So SDG 6, under decent work and economic growth, again, fits very, very nicely into the work that we're doing it. So that, you know, having predated um, the SDGs, we're now, um, we're now actually mapping them to our activities. They're helping shape our activities. But I suppose the important issue is how do we get buy-in um, into our business to the SDGs and our commitments under Plan A as a whole? And that is really developing a compelling business narrative around the commitments and the SDGs, a business narrative that can align to core business strategy and where possible takes a triple bottom line approach to achieving those objectives. And I'll just give two examples of where we think we can, we are achieving those triple bottom objectives, so economic, environmental and social benefits. So we launched um, year before last a community solar scheme to, to actually um, invite customers to invest in 
um, with a, a cooperative, a, a community solar cooperative, to invest in uh, putting solar panels onto eight stores or, or in our UK estate. And that delivers obviously a lower carbon output, uh, a good environmental uh, benefit because it's energy through solar that we use in our stores. So that that's a great benefit. It also provides a great cost benefit to M&S because it means that we can procure the energy at a lower rate than we would through traditional methods. But also uh, it means that there's a return to investors um, off that procurement that M&S does through those panels. And at the end, when investors are paid back, there's also a great community return because it means that we can um, we can use any leftover funds for community projects around energy efficiency and renewables. Uh, we also believe that tackling model slavery, another example, um, has a triple bottom um, benefit as well to us. So it improves the lives of people that work in our um, in our supply chains, improves their working conditions, provides equitable economic growth to them. But it also means that our supply chains are more resilient, productive and loyal to Marks and Spencer. So those are just two examples of how if you can develop a compelling a uh, narrative, a business narrative that, 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 that is aligned to your core business strategy, that SDG implementation and, and, and you know, sustainable strategy implementation like Plan A at m and can bring about great traction within a business. That makes it sound really easy, I know, but actually it's not. Uh, there are many things that um, are challenging in terms of how we, you know, we apply and map to SDGs in our sustainability strategy and business strategy m and yeah, people, um, the, the, the biggest change is the need to adapt. Uh, retail and many sectors across the world are facing huge amounts of change and, and, and uh, pressures. So we can't have a plan, a plan A, that stays still. It needs to continuously evolve. Uh, it needs to set a direction of travel, but it needs to be fairly agile within it. I'd suggest perhaps that SDGs too, in time, will need to adapt. We also want to we try and work with others but that's not enough we've heard already on on the webinar systemic change working with others collaborations partnerships and advocacy is really important we've not done enough of that we need to do more and also the importance of local relevance so sdgs seem fairly um unconnected to your local um uh, sort of context what our customers are telling us is i want to know what you're doing in my local community where i live and breathe um, and what act action is MS taking at a very local place? But be that in a factory where we source clothing from, a farm where we, we get potatoes from, or a shop with a lo local community around that shop. And that's an important fact thing to note about SDGs and translating them right down to local context. But I suppose I want to end by saying um, the biggest challenge we've got is, is actually perhaps connecting SDGs to our customers, to, to the public. And I want to cite some work that a well-known communications agency, Futera, have done in this space called, they've taken the SDGs and actually translated them into good life goals, as they call them. Simple behavior asks for each of the SDGs. It's kind of, a, as in their own words, a playful attempt to show how SDGs could be translated into lifestyles. And I think it's a good example of how, how, this, how, how talking about the SDGs in an understandable way will enable them to get more traction. So, for example, SDG for quality education in a lifestyle way could be about learn and teach. Clean water and sanitation could be about save water and wash hands. Sustainable cities and communities, which may mean a lot to people uh, who are in really knowledgeable about that, but actually to Joe Public, to our customers, could be about love where you live, bringing back that sort of local context to it. I'll, I'll pause there and I really look forward to um, have, uh, sort of uh, sharing some thoughts over some Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Munish, for all that information. Really insightful. We're getting lots of questions. I just, uh, I'm just aware of the time. So um, just before jumping to the question, a uh, small point from my end. All of this will be discussed at the 13 Responsible Business uh, Supply Chain Summit Europe that will take place on the 10th and 11th of October in London. You can see on your screen a little bit of information. And all the questions that we are not able to respond today will be uh, tried to be answered and shared with all of you. So the first question will be um, for uh, Anna and Munish very briefly. So what are the main challenges uh, that you have encountered? One first main challenge when integrating the SDGs into your business uh, strategy. Shall I? Can, uh, thanks, Candy. Shall I go first? Um, 
And I think actually Manish just referred to this at the end as well. I, I think the main challenge was moving beyond the SDGs are vis visually very appealing. And the first piece of work that we did, I think, was visually very appealing within the business. Getting beyond that to really having people grapple with um, the way the SDGs can really be, um, really need to be aligned into business priorities. And as soon as you start to delve beyond the goal level into the target level, which you have to do if you want to think about um, real potential impacts that your business can have and um, potential benefits for the business, they become very um, opaque and quite quite challenging to understand. <laughs> so I think a kind of a, a translation and this is the reason why we created SAB Miller, you know, a tool to make it easier for colleagues right across the business to engage in the SDGs in a language that, that made sense to them. So that that was the, the big challenge and how we went about tackling it. I'll come in there um, just to really um, two, two, two specifics really from my perspective in terms of challenge. Uh, one is measurability and, and, and instead of, I suppose, all of us inventing our own way of measuring the impact of SDGs, I wonder whether the next stage, and maybe this is some of the work that Aris referred to earlier in the SDG 100 comment that he made, is actually how do you make, how do you create a tool where not just that you could measure the impact of SDGs on the, um, the, the impact of your activities and their SDG return, but actually how can you also share examples? Um, and I know there are platforms that do that already, but could there be more done on that to encourage best practice sharing? And the last one is is just uh, reiterating the, the last point I made and the point that Anna made, which is, which is actually talking about the SDGs not in a sort of lofty way. Um, I'm trying to be as respectful as I can to them, but in a way in which they make really good, compelling business sense, and more importantly, that every single person on this planet can understand what it means to them and their lifestyle. Thank you very much, Munish. Um, uh Aris, I would love to have your opinion on this question. So how can the SDGs really be internalized in supply chains when it's clear that the market isn't ready to pay for it? So are there any other sources of fundings or budget for this? Uh, thank you, Kandia. I think um, John and Monish and Anna will have their views on this. I can speak from, from my experience. Uh, th there's definitely things that one can do um, uh, 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 that apply to all sustainability uh, practices. You know, the type of stuff about getting buy-in, uh, creating quick wins, uh, creating champions, create allies, and so on. All that applies equally to the SDGs. You know, there, there are things that organizations do to facilitate funding when it comes to sustainability initiatives in the SDGs. Sometimes they lower the threshold of what qualifies as an investment. Sometimes they extend the payback periods and so on. All those things apply equally to like on, on, on the SDGs. Um, I think what we have done in, in when we're working with the supply chain, and it has proved uh, illuminating for the people in the room was to bring together the buyers, the retailers, and their suppliers and have a conversation for a day or two about some of the challenges, uh, the different perspectives, some of the opportunities that they see at different levels, and some of the best practices that, that are emerging. Ultimately, that allows people from both ends of the spectrum to identify opportunities to be more efficient, to be more effective, to speak the, the, uh, the same language, and, and, and so on. I think I was surprised to see a couple of years when we started doing this, how disconnected some of those approaches are between kind of the companies at the top of the chain and then the, the people right along the supply chain. And my understanding is that we don't do this enough. We don't bring people together along the, the supply chain, along the value chain, enough. Um, in, in a sort of an, in a safe environment where you can have a very honest conversation. Once we do that, in my experience, um, the opportunities to, to when it comes to funding, to um, identifying those types of, of opportunities, to speak in the common language, to finding pools of knowledge and expertise, 
are much easier. And, and, and I'll say one more thing, just going back to, if, if I may, Candy, to the previous question. We are a little bit of a slave to the sort of the management school language and, and, and practice. You know, the, the practices that have been emerging over the last kind of half um, 50 years or half century. We have this assumption that um, the current organizations are really well set up and, and they have the leadership, the skill set, and the networks that are fit for purpose. And all we need to do is just to translate the SDGs into you know, whatever business language is, and then the, the, the business engine will, will start to roll and take them on board. That's definitely part of the story. But I think the way we see society and business and expectations evolving, evolving there's definitely big chunks missing in terms of vision, in terms of conversation about purpose, leadership skills, ability to collaborate. And, and I think we need to go a little bit beyond trying to fit the SDGs and sustainability into how businesses operate and try and rethink and evolve a little bit what businesses actually set out to do and what kind of skills and people and teams and, and, and processes they have in there. Great, Aris. Thank you very much. So now, one question to all of you, starting with John, please. Uh, what types of collaboration and partnerships are the most effective to help an, our, on our, on our, oui, an organization sorry, achieve the SDGs? So what type of collaboration and partnership are key? Well, I'm actually going to go back to um, what Aris said. If you start with your supply chain all the way along it, get them together, um, for a workshop for one or two days and just have that discussion about how different people are approaching. We did that with the Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership with our supply chain and it was it was remarkable to see the discussion um, that you could have and that is a great start point um, for anyone or any organisation to take. Aris, please, to you. Well, I, I think there's there's, there's many different there's different types of, of, of examples. There's many wonderful ways that one can um, improve, if you like, the partnership and, and the collaboration. I think there's, there's, there's need, there needs to be a, a recognition that we have to do this in, in, in partnership. To try and experiment, you know, build the, if you like, the evidence base with other organizations. There's, there's things that one can do. There's amazing things that people can do across the value chain, but also, as, as one of my colleagues says, a lot of the opportunities with the SDGs are cross-sectoral. They, 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 they fall between what each sector can, can provide and because that's where the joint, the shared risks also exist. And we, generally, we're not very good at that. Um, but the, the more we can do to bring companies from different sectors together that have a stake, in a specific issue, even if they're coming from different angles, the more likely that we'll be able to think, uh, to come up with solutions that are both transformative and, 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 and secondly, much more effective. We certainly need much more than that. In order to do that, we do need that mind shift, that this is, has to, this is something that can be done and should be done and needs to be done with others rather than just looking internally. Thank you very much, Aris. Munish, to you very briefly, please. So um, uh, I think this is a really good um, uh, good discussion. We've talked quite a lot around systemic change, and we've talked quite a lot around um, needing to not just insularly deal with uh, the SDGs, but try and learn from each other. Um, and that can only be done when you when you work vertically and horizontally across all the different areas. But but in our experience of of trying to work with others for the last ten years. It's, it's the partnerships that you, you think would never exist that are the most fruitful. Um, and sometimes it's partnerships with much smaller organizations than yours that bring about the greatest benefits. So just a couple of examples off the top of my head. One is an, a partnership we have with um, a charity called Frazzled, um, which is run by Ruby Wax, um, around providing people with spaces and some counseling to deal with some of the mental uh, mental health pressures that uh, you know people undergo, and we've partnered with her to provide that kind of space in some of our stores and the cafes in our stores. And again, that uh, Ruby came in to give a. Uh, we, we occasionally have people 
coming into MS to to inspire us and she's a very inspirational lady and she came in and from that presentation as a bit of learning and development for colleagues at, in, in our head office it's turned into a partnership now that's in more than 20 of our shops uh, another example is working with a small um, platform called Neighbourly, um, well, a small getting larger platform called Neighbourly, who work with a number of brands now, but they help us take the food that we're not able to sell in our shops, but is still fit for human consumption, to uh, a number of small charities in local communities right across the UK. And so these collaborations don't need to be at large conferences and at large scale between two large organisations. They can often be the most atypical, unpredictable collaborations that you could never imagine. You just need to be open-minded to make them. Thank you very much, Munish. Anna, to you, lastly. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with much of what's been said. Uh, to me, two keys to, to finding the right partnerships. One is um, being absolutely crystal clear. What's the problem you're trying to solve or the opportunity you're trying to capture and, I, and finding organisations that have that same problem or opportunity as a high priority. And then secondly, um, looking for partnerships work when there is a relationship of trust between you know, individuals within those organizations that hopefully then over time build out to, to other individuals. And so being open-minded and, and, and quite smart and creative about how to find the organizations that meet those two um, requirements is I think what makes a partnership really work. Thank you very much. So um, yeah, time is running out. Um, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, firstly, to the four of you, um, Anna, Joan, Aris, and Munish, thank you very much for your insight and time today. And thanks to everyone that has joined us in this excellent discussion, and I'm afraid time has run out. Everyone who signed up to the webinar will receive a recording of today's webinar in two weeks' time. Uh, if your questions weren't answered, you can raise this with our speakers and 200 more delegates who will be joining us at the 13 Responsible Supply Chain Summit Europe taking place on the, on the 10th and 11th of October, as I mentioned just earlier on, in London. So please, please visit Ethical Corporation Supply Chain for the full speaker lineup and agenda. And once again, thanks everyone for listening and see you next time. All the best to all of you. Have a lovely day. Thank you.